Hello and welcome to Hair in the Hawthorne. My name's Kate Ray and we have an extended interview. I haven't done one of these for a while. We've been having short bursts of people's experiences. So it's really exciting for me to get back in the saddle and, and do a, a longer chat with somebody and getting back to really the roots of this channel, which is talking about the world of the fae and fairies. So my next guest is a gentleman that I have had the pleasure of chatting with over the sort of probably last eight months or something. Um, started off with a with a love of, of fairies and then has just kind of entered into all kinds of different discussions. I'm going to give you a brief rundown of who he is, literally really brief, because I'd like him to explain uh, his background and take that as a starting point from where we're going. So with us today, we've got Neil Rushton and he has a PhD in uh, you're going to get this right, archaeology and history. Um, he also is an author, he's free, freelance writer uh, in historical and folklore, and has had uh, one book published, which I really want to talk about, but that's going to be later on, um, that is uh, a novel. Um, and it, it's, it's brilliant, and I'm, I'm dead excited to talk about that bit. So welcome, Neil, and thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, Kate. Delighted to be with you. Good, good. Can you um, explain, because I just gave a brief introduction to you there, and I know that there's a whole sort of bubble around those things. It was very, very brief. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, a little bit more about uh, those aspects that I've, I've just talked about? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, as, as you say, um, I am trained as an archaeologist, and I started as an archaeologist in 1993, which makes me feel rather old, um, you know, thinking back, it's nearly 30 years, isn't it? You think, oh, 93, it was just a few no. years ago. No, it was 30, 30 28 years ago. No. Um, <laughs> and um, I, this is actually before I went to university. Um, uh, I got, um, I got involved with a guy called Chris Curry, the late Chris Curry, who was an archeologist, very well-known archeologist in Hampshire in the 80s and the 90s and I just happened to sort of tag along with him one day at a dig and he took me on as a field archaeologist and so I spent the next couple of years just learning the ropes of field archaeology until I did well between us we decided I needed to go to university to get the the theory to get the qualifications to, to be a proper archaeologist mm -hmm. you, you know and so that's what I did in 95. Uh, I went to Southampton University to do archaeology with history. Um, uh, so I got a BA and an MA. And then I went to Trinity College, Cambridge to do the PhD. Mm -hmm. um, now, the subject matter of the PhD is nothing we're going to be talking about today. It's about actually about the outer precincts of monasteries in medieval England. Uh, very data driven, very sort of materialistic uh, PhD. Mm -hmm. But that, that was OK. That took me three years to, to, to do. Now, during my time at university, uh, both Southampton and Cambridge, I was increasingly interested in folklore. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, especially at that time, the folklore surrounding prehistoric monuments. Um, uh, I realise I'm going off on one here. Do you want me to carry on telling yeah, you? Yeah, please you know, do. Uh, I mean, those, how, kind of, how I, those kind of beginnings really intrigue me, and especially it's like, can you remember the, the, the real catalyst, or was it just a, a very easy transition into the, into the folklore? Well, th th no, that's that's interesting. It, it it was a very sudden transition in in many ways. Uh, as soon as I was at Southampton, I was realising that there was all sorts of folklore connected to, especially prehistoric monuments in Britain. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about, and it, it certainly wasn't on um, the, the the curriculum at, at the university. Nobody was talking about that kind of thing at that time. I don't know whether that's changed at all now, but off my own back, because I was traveling around the country a lot because I was still working as an archaeologist with Chris and we'd always, wherever we were working, we'd always take a look at the, the prehistoric monuments and, and, and getting to know, especially Neolithic long barrows, um, Bronze Age um, uh, uh, barrows. And 
I just started read it, reading. I've got all these books lined up so I can show you where all my Brilliant. influences came, came from. So at that time, I read this, mm -hmm. which is Leslie Grinsell, who was an archaeologist, Folklore of Prehistoric Sites in Britain, which was mm -hmm. written in 76. I think I'm right about that. 1976. And he very systematically went through all of the folklore connected with prehistoric sites, as the, as the, as the title suggests, but mm -hmm. he had a special interest in the fairies and how, uh, uh, what kind of correlation there, there was between fairy sightings, fairy experiences in the folklore mm -hmm. to prehistoric monuments. And sure enough, there's, there's lots of it. It's a brilliant distribution map of Britain, fairy sightings at prehistoric monuments in Britain, which... Uh, obviously that's 76 that's over four decades ago so it's a bit out of date and if you produce that um distribution map now um actually that's a really good idea mm -hmm. that's an idea for a project that's mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if you produce that um distribution map now there, there'll be many hundreds more and more widespread mm -hmm. uh, across the country i think so so that as soon as i read that all right there's some there's something in it there's something in this um, and I don't know why I was attracted to the idea of fairy folklore mm -hmm. it was just it's just something I knew even then um, that there was something intrinsically important to our understanding of history and our understanding of our own consciousness collective or personal consciousness that they represented couldn't quite put my couldn't put my finger on it mm -hmm. but then two, two books which are also written in the mid to late 70s um, were massive influences and really changed my thinking about how important the folklore was even when I was working as an archaeologist I was drifting off more and more in an interest towards the folklore and of course mm -hmm. I think I think most people will be familiar with mm -hmm. Catherine Briggs's Encyclopedia of Fairies which I absolutely love um, you know, you know, you know, it's still worth dipping into to this day. Um, long out of print and very expensive to get hold of, but a, a fantastic uh, volume, which really triggered my interest in fairies. Uh, but then, even even more important. So I, I haven't got that many, but I've, I've got about <laughs> no, go through them, please. <laughs> yeah, about hundred books. <laughs> yeah. Down here ready. Um, um, and again, you know all about this one. Mm -hmm. which of course is Brian Frude and Alan Lee's fairies with, you know, the fantastic imagery. Mm -hmm. It's a gorgeous you, book. Which... It's, it's a gorgeous book, but um, yeah, I, I, everybody who's watched any of my YouTubes uh, knows that I'm, I'm yeah. a big, big, big fan. Yeah. Pictures on the wall and, uh, to prove it as yeah. well. Um, and that, uh, that they actually took uh, Catherine Briggs's descriptions of many of the fairies in in order to create their their image their imagery, which mm -hmm. is absolutely absolutely superb. And so, after getting into it, um, one day in and I'm going to get the year right. It's mid nineties. So you know, you're all drifting into one one mm -hmm. you know, in mid nineties. That's good enough. So I was still at university, and I went to a site in Wiltshire called West Kennet Longbarrow mm -hmm. which is a Neolithic burial chamber it would have been used for other things apart from um, burials um, and that's that's dating about four and a half maybe even five thousand years old and it's a magnificent site have you been to West Kennet? I've not been to that one no and I, I like to think that I'm pretty well traveled with uh with these monuments so no no I haven't well it's just it's about a mile from Avebury Stone Circle and part of that complex with Silbury Hill yeah, yeah. Uh, and the Stone Rose um, and at one end of it or just beyond one end of it is West Kennet Longbarrow it's a bit you, you must go so I, I could thoroughly thoroughly recommend it mm. and uh, it was excavated in the 50s um, and so you can go into the the, bur the main back burial chamber and it's got four four don't quote me on that might be six but several side chambers mm -hmm. which is where all, all of the burials were found when it was excavated um and i 
went in there and meditated for the night. Um, the, I'd just gotten into meditation at that time in order to try and deal with certain things. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a good idea and it was kind of working for me, but I'd never meditated at a, 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 an ancient site before. Well, give it a go. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that was my, that, that was when everything fell into place because that was the first time I saw a fairy. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, I've described this before um, to, to, on several other podcasts, but um, just very briefly, I was meditating in the chamber and uh, a fairy appeared walking up towards me, walking up the line of the, the, the long barrow. And, well, he looked like a fruit fairy. Mm -hmm. Little chap, hat, rustic, antiquated clothes, it lasted um, a minute, mm -hmm. maybe maybe a minute. No interaction. He was looking straight at me, but no audible interaction. And you think, well, it's dark. You're in a Neolithic burial chamber, and there's this little fellow walking up towards you. you what what would you do? Would you be kind of uh, climbing the walls? Mm -hmm. uh, probably because I was in a meditative state. It all seemed perfectly natural. It just seemed like the most natural thing in the world. So my, my first fairy experience was at um, Wayland Smithy. And oh. it, the same thing, when I had that experience, I didn't, it took me a few minutes, a moments after the occurrence that I just thought that was weird. When it was yeah. happening, it just felt very normal and very natural. <laughs> Were, were you meditating there? Not at all. No, I was no. I was just walking along down a path. It was a sunny day, bright sunny morning. Um, I I was hearing singing. Um, I, I've explained it before on, on various things. Of It was like the clangers, sort of that whistly tone <laughs> singing going off. <laughs> and um, every time I stopped, the singing stopped, and I could hear the rustling, rustling in the hedge bottoms. And I kept leaping on the hedge bottoms and parting it. I could see like things bursting off, you know, um, and then part of the grass uh, literally caught this thing as a part of the grass. And yeah, it turned around at me. And there was a, a suspended moment that felt like forever. And it squealed at me, <laughs> to which I squealed back and, and it shot off. But it was, it was, as you say, it was a very earthy looking thing. It had tweed trousers on. I remember to this day, it was very furry, but kind of toad shaped. So very, very earthy, earthy looking mm -hmm. thing. And, and yep. about, about yay big. Um, yep. But yeah, it was just that, oh my God, I've, I, I, I used to call it a gnome. I don't think it's a gnome, but that was the only way I could describe mm -hmm. it. So... Yeah. Well, you, what what we what you were saying that you know you weren't meditating, but uh, as as we maybe we'll touch on a, a little bit later, you may well have just drifted into enough of an altered state of consciousness to allow you to see outside, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum, the things that are actually always there mm -hmm. were were allowed in for so that's really i mean wayland smithy is very similar kind of long barrow to west kennet mm -hmm. uh west kennet west kennet's just a bit bigger um but in terms of the entity that i w was brought into my to, to to my view looking like a fruit fairy that may have been me being predisposed to think of a fairy looking like that because I'd been, I'd, it would have been a few years I'd read, you know, looked mm -hmm. at fruits and Alan Lee are very familiar with it by, by this time. <clears throat> and so whatever that entity was, and it was startlingly real, you know, mm -hmm. there's no, I, I wasn't falling. I know I'm saying I'm in a meditative state. I was not asleep. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was there and I will never forget it. If I close my eyes, I can still picture his face. And, um, uh, but is that what you really, is that what that entity or that, that energy, is that what it really looked like? Or is that just me being mm -hmm. predisposed and 
uh, my consciousness making um, making it real to me in that form. Mm. I mean, um, there's, I, I, there's the other side of it, though, that I like to think in these things that um, is it that form taking a shape that you can understand, that you can interpret, um, yeah. not just your own consciousness, but is that thing you know, got some connection with you um, on some unconscious level that says, ah, that's their reference. I know that they're going to know yep. who I am if I present in this manner. Yes. Um, and certainly, again, we can talk about other experiences later on, but the, the, the fairies have always manifested, almost always manifested in that kind of form. Mm -hmm. Because as you say, that's what I'm expecting Mm -hmm. um and th th and whether it's me coding it in that way or whether it's them doing it to me i, I don't have the answer but mm -hmm. uh it's, it was, that was that was the beginning of my real interest in folklore and the fairies because i suddenly realized as with any direct gnostic experience you could no longer discount it. It's no longer someone telling you an anecdote mm -hmm. or even reading a hundred anecdotes. You personally have experienced it and you know that it's real mm -hmm. and no one can take it away from you. And as soon as I knew that, right, this, this needs to be investigated uh, a little further. And so the, the years went on, you know, through my degrees, through the PhD, and then I, carried on working as an archaeologist for Chris and various other organizations uh, but the folklore was interesting it was was growing you know become a member of the folklore society you read all the journal articles you go back into the folklore journals and you realize how much there is um, and then sure enough you know with once the internet was really up and up and running in the 2000s um, so much that previously you'd have only found in books was suddenly available mm -hmm. and uh, uh and and well there it is my, my specific interest has, has kind of moved from the traditional folklore i think any anyone investigating fairies you've got to know the traditional folklore yeah. you can't go straight into um uh, modern entity encounters without understanding where mm. it came from mm -hmm. and uh, uh but my interest has definitely moved into looking at what the fairies are now mm. and what the what their contemporary meaning is for human culture and uh you know a, a collective consciousness that's that's kind of where i am at the moment can i ask before that encounter before the archaeology did you have any kind of sway at all? What, what were your feelings as you were growing up about, about that kind of realm? Because as children, we're all exposed to, to the fairy realm in one way or another. Um, can, was it something that interested you or something that you didn't really bother with? Or um, Definitely not. I, I was brought up in a, a non-religious, non-spiritual home. Mm -hmm. And there was it was quite a materialistic upbringing. Uh, I'm not saying that to denigrate, it's just the way mm. it was. Um, and it was only once I got into my 20s and just started getting interested in uh, more esoteric, mm -hmm. in a very light way, more esoteric subject matter and very, you know, read some ghost stories, mm. um, uh, read about certain paranormal things. But, but the fairies were my interest in them came definitely during my degree and the realization that folklore and archaeology are a little bit more intimately connected mm -hmm. than I'd previously realized. So, so yeah, n nothing, nothing until I went to university and then that first experience. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, talking about, I mean, I like you, I, 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 I notice a correlation between these, these ancient sacred places and, and uh, people's experiences, whether it just be uh, a feeling or a sense. Um, I, I did a study of Sherwood Forest just for my own amusement many years ago where I asked other dog walkers 
about their um, understanding of the energies within uh, the forest. And there were definite mm -hmm. areas that were no-go areas after a certain time. And there were areas that felt a lot lighter. So why do you think that there is such an attraction to, to these ancient places for these beings that sightings are more prolific than they are, say, in an urban environment? Yeah, there's several, several parts to my answer to, to that. Um, first, I'm pretty convinced that prehistoric people, when they were putting up these monuments, which, remember, must have taken a massive communal effort mm -hmm. to put up, put up these, 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 these mon monuments, and they weren't locating them by accident. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a materialist archaeologist will just say for long barrows say, oh, well, they were just marking their boundaries and they're always, you know, they're always on the edge of a, of a tribal boundary, uh, usually in the absence of any, um, uh, it, it, any real data to, to suggest that's so. Mm -hmm. And although I haven't said that, I've no data to suggest what I'm about to suggest in is that they're picking those places because they're sacred. Mm -hmm. They're they're locating them at places where maybe they were seeing non-human entities mm -hmm. and therefore you know they were seen as a special place uh, a, you know a portal or a, 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 a division place between this reality and another world and imagine a prehistoric person coming up against these entities they would they would have great significance mm -hmm. and so the uh, that's why I think those those places are quite special. But getting away from the specialness of prehistoric monuments, what you will notice in modern fairy encounters, modern fairy, you know, from, from the 20th century through till now, is that they can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I've become, although places like Long barrows and prehistoric monuments, I, I think they are special and sacred places, but I think it's more important the person's state of consciousness, mm -hmm. the individual state of consciousness. If it's in the right place and conditions are right, the fairies, non-human entities of any type can just turn up mm -hmm. and can't come within your consciousness remit. So you look, you, you'll, you'll be very familiar with uh, Simon Young's, uh, census in the in the fairy investigation yes. society which was taken out between 2014 and 2017 there's another one in production at this mm -hmm. very moment but that original census uh, there, were, there were over 500 accounts right uh, coming, coming mostly from the 21st century but also from the late 20th century and two things i really took away from from that census is one as i've just said they can happen anywhere and two, there is always or almost always uh, an expression of a slight change in consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, I think only two accounts in the census specifically state that the people had taken psilocybin. Yeah. So altering, altering their state of consciousness in, in, in that way. All of the others, it was more subtle. Uh, I was relaxed. I was angry. I was grieving. Mm -hmm. um, just, just normal con human conditions, but just taking them away from their regular everyday state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, it's very noticeable in in the census. I think that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, going back to exactly what you were saying. Uh, about Wayland, your, your experience at Wayland Smithy, I'm asking you, are you in a meditative state? You say you're not, but actually you were probably in, uh, I, I don't know, daydream states. Definitely. Just thinking about just other things than, you know, what, what, what you're going to buy for dinner. Mm -hmm. You're in a little bit, bit, bit more open to the possibility of something coming in from beyond a, a usual bounds of reality and uh, and contacting you so 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 that's a very long and tangential way of an asking <laughs> of answering your question um uh prehistoric sites yeah they're important but i think in terms of the fairy phenomenon 
it can happen absolutely anywhere from a New York apartment to, um, to, to the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and that, that particular area really interests me from a paranormal investigation point of view. Just going back, though, to, to um, Simon Young's census that he did, I, I was actually one of the participants in that, and I did uh, give him one or two of the, the scenarios that I was in. And like you say, I wasn't in a meditative state, as in I hadn't put myself there, but I remember... That night I, I camped, I was camping out and I didn't sleep at all. So I was very much in that kind of, you know, um, haven't slept. I'm a bit kind of woozy and a bit, a bit sleepy about, but it was a beautiful sunny day. So I felt very, very relaxed. And the other times when I've seen them haven't been in an atypical meditative state, but thinking about it, it they have been, you know, relaxed states of being. So my first question before I get into the apartment and seeing things within the home, is um, why do you think some people have an ability without forcing it to be able to um, have interactions with these beings? Some people have to work at bringing these things in and meditating, and some people don't have this experience at all. Or if they do, obviously, that they, they, they brush it off and write it off. What yeah. do you think the subtle differences between, between people are in that respect? Um, I think it's probably your social position to some, some degree. If you are a hardline materialist reductionist who simply does not believe in any kind of paranormal activity or non-human intelligence mm -hmm. you're going to find it much more difficult because you will just brush it off like as you say you will explain it away mm -hmm. it's not that's not always the case there are examples of people who have sort of oh my goodness this is, mm -hmm. this is the world isn't ha how i thought it was but um if you're just open like like going back to my own experience in the 90s i was just starting to think hold on what what's what's going on here this isn't this isn't the world that i thought it was and then sure enough in it in it comes but i i should also add that i'm not particularly one of the people who is able to just invoke these mm. these beings like um what uh, the, the irish and scottish in folklore would call them seers or mm. having the second sight so going back you know something like the 17th century robert kirk and the secret commonwealth mm -hmm. where he's where he's talking about the people with the second sight and there's only a few of them mm -hmm. it's not everyone seeing the fairies uh, it's it, it's certain people and i think that has just come down the ages and there will be certain people now who are just open-minded enough that's a bad phrase saying you, you're open-minded but a little bit more accepting that perhaps this 3d reality five cents reality is not all there is mm -hmm. there is something else and those people are much more able to just touch through the barriers and perhaps whatever is coming from the other side realizes that it's not just down to that person. Um, they are recognising um, uh, what, what's going on. There's a no, there's a nice example to 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 demonstrate this, and we're going to get on. We can talk about psychedelics, can we? Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, know this is, I, I know no children allowed to. No. There's a children's <laughs> warning on this, yeah. and just just in case there are any members of the local constabulary watching. <laughs> Uh, we don't con we don't condone mm -hmm. the use of class A drugs. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely not under any circumstances. But <laughs> um, <laughs> most of my experiences have come through taking psychedelics. You're mm -hmm. talking about forcing it. I don't see really see taking psychedelics as forcing it, mm -hmm. but you are purposely altering your state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, uh, apart from my eye condition, which we'll talk about in a minute. Oh, that's yeah. the way that that's the way that that most most of my experiences uh, have happened and talking about psychedelics you must go to um dimethyltryptamine and okay. report the dmt uh very very powerful psychedelic um it's been synthesized since the 30s i think um and 
it's like no other psychedelic and mm -hmm. it's you know it's an astounding experience when I mean, I've, I've had the experience twice on, on mm -hmm. dmt um and what people will usually uh explain as happening is being blasted through to a totally different reality so what we've been talking so far is the you know these subtle interactions and intersects mm -hmm. between between this and other mm -hmm. uh dmt just does away with all of that you are in another world and so many of the reports the the, the famous book is by rick strap dr rick rick, rick strassman mm -hmm. um uh, about his study on about 50 people in the 90s uh, at the university of new mexico mm -hmm. uh you, you, you got to you got to read that book is this one down here no i don't have that on hand mm -hmm. but uh it's it, it, there's amazing experiences of when they're injected with the dmt at certain different levels mm -hmm. um and 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 there are there are other more anecdotal um reports and surveys and one of them is by uh, a computational physicist called peter mayer mm -hmm. um I, th I think it's called 340 dmt trip reports it's on, it's online you can just mm -hmm. go and find it online and so here's a here's an example of you know where, where we're going in terms of you are purposely altering your state of consciousness mm -hmm. and going into a very different reality do you find fairies there uh, are there fairies there the the answer is very often mm -hmm. large percentage of these experiences will include what we would probably think within uh, being within the you know the zoology of of, of fairies mm -hmm. and let, let me just if it, I'll, ju I'll just briefly read you one of yeah, the accounts please, please do yeah. yeah just to give you a, a taste of, of what this is about so this is number 65 from peter mayer's um account so someone's he's taken the dmt and within seconds this time i saw the elves as multi-dimensional creatures formed by strands of visible language they were more creaturely than i had ever seen them before the message was changing from the initial from the initial Okay, okay, safe, safe. The elves were dancing in and out of the multi-dimensional visible language matrix, waving their arms and limbs, hands, fingers, if they had fingers, and smiling or laughing, although I, I couldn't really see their faces. The elves were telling me, or I was understanding them to say, t telling me telepathically, that I had seen them before in early childhood. Memories were flooding back of seeing the elves. They look just like they do now. Ever-shifting, folding, multi-dimensional, multi-coloured, always laughing, weaving, waving, showing me things, showing me the visible language they are created of, teaching me to speak and read. So that's really interesting on so many levels. I mean, apart from it being a, a kind of wow experience, which is always what you get on DMT. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he's suddenly related it back to early childhood. Mm -hmm. And and of course, many kids in early childhood will see the fairies. They'll be playing with the fairies. Then they grow out of it. They go mm -hmm. to school and it gets indoctrinated out of them. Uh, and this guy is is well purposely directly correlating that massive experience in adulthood to the same creatures being there mm -hmm. in his childhood. He's just forgotten that they exist or stopped being able to see him. And this substance, in this case DMT, has allowed him to alter his state of consciousness almost to where it was when he, he was a child. I just thought uh, that's that's a very good example of what certain psychedelic substances how they are able to alter your state of consciousness mm -hmm. in into that state which in some ways is like being a child so do you know you know when he spoke about i mean the first thing that came to my mind when he spoke about they were created out of a visual language I mean, that that has got so many like offshoots to it about, you know, our connection with the Fey realm and music. And is that their visual language? Is the visual language something that they reverberate out? And it's something that we yeah. pick up on our own energy levels as opposed to an, an auditory level. It's like that that for me, that just one line is just mind yeah. blowing, you know, because yeah. it's, it's like I can't I can I can't imagine how that would be visually 
how, how that, that would form visually. I, I guess the only, the, the closest you can get to it, um, you know, in a, in a kind of rationalistic way is to talk about synesthesia, mm -hmm. where you can see sounds um uh you know the, the basically the senses are mixed you can see a smell mm -hmm. uh uh that kind of makes sense at, to, to to a certain level but i think what he's trying to articulate there is something that is impossible to mm -hmm. in, to articulate within our language um you know it's ineffable mm -hmm. so many of these experiences you can't quite describe what it was like mm -hmm. You, it's just a knowing and that is what whatever fairies are whatever uh, energy form they are that's what they're plugging into they're not plugging in to um a five sense understanding mm -hmm. of reality they're beyond it and under certain circumstances whether you've taken drugs or meditated or whatever the situation they're able to to pop in mm -hmm. and pop out what is interesting in both in say the fairy investigation society uh, survey other reports that, that you'll read as well as these reports of um, psychedelic experiences is that you don't have much control over what they're going to do no there can be interaction with them definitely interaction but they do what they want mm -hmm. Uh, and I think I think that that's quite important. That, that kind of links back to the folklore, where most of the times, you know, the fairies could be um, immoral bandits. Yeah. They, they, they you know, they, there was no controlling. There were little tricks and tactics to, you know, not uh, so that they wouldn't harm you. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, they were in the folklore and in these modern experiences, they do seem to be, if not a superior life force, mm -hmm. they do seem to be um, more advanced than us in terms of they have the control. Yeah, definitely. Can uh, I, and can, that, can I just take you back quickly? Cause I don't want to lose the thread on this. I, I know that they, uh, you, you've just spoken about the, psychedelic experiences with DMT and I mean we, we could talk that subject for, for hours yeah. and hours and hours you know with um, anecdotal evidence from ayahuasca trips etc cetera, etc cetera. what I want to talk yeah. to you about is something you alluded to earlier and, and we both early early on uh, chatting um, spoke about something that we, we don't have the same but we have similar altered states of perception through um, through what would be seen as illness or, or mm. something wrong with us. Uh, for me, yeah. it's temporal lobe epilepsy. And yeah. um, that definitely was inexplicable in the changes of. And, and you also have something that changes your perspective as well, mm. don't you? I, I do. Um, it is called Charles Bonnet syndrome. And so, sorry, I just need to step back to explain that in uh, 2050, late it was actually Halloween on 2015, believe it or not. Um, I lost a lot of my eyesight. Mm -hmm. uh, so that from then till now, uh, I have no sight in my left eye at all. Mm -hmm. And my right my right eye isn't great. It's, uh, I usually try, the easiest way to explain it is close your left eye and squint your right eye. Yeah. And that's kind of what it's less as near as I can get, but I've, you know, there's lack of peripheral vision in the right hand side as well. Mm -hmm. So um, very soon after that happened, um, uh, I began to see the types of entities, the types of fairies that I'd only previously seen on psychedelics or that mm -hmm. one time in, in West Kennet. Mm -hmm. Very, you know, basically they're the same things and they're turning up in my living room. Mm -hmm. um, at a time, uh, this is before, uh, I'll explain about Charles Bonnet syndrome in a moment, but um, this is before I knew anything about it. And as you can imagine, that amount of eyesight loss is very traumatic. Mm and you it's it, it has uh, the 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 potential to destroy you mm -hmm. and for a while i thought I, i'm not going to be able to cope with this and then 
little creatures start turning up in my living room. So my first thought is, even though I've seen these before on psychedelics, maybe this is different. And mm. the trauma is causing um, severe psychosis. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, uh, I, when I went to my ophthalmologist, uh, the, the next visit, I, I just, oh, well, I better tell him about this. Mm -hmm. And he was quite blase, quite blase about it. Oh, that's Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, and he, uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome is named after a, a French, or was he Swiss? Don't quote me on this. French or Swiss naturalists in the mid 18th century who first noticed it in mm -hmm. people who had lost uh, part of their vision. Mm -hmm. And all things can appear over the over the years. There's been lots of um, uh, you know the reports. People can see giants, spectral ladies, elves, fairies, all, all sorts all sorts of things turn up, and there's often a sort of cartoon quality to it. Mm -hmm. um, but so my ophthalmologist told me, and then of course went and did the research and found out the, the the general explanation for this you go onto the nhs site is mm -hmm. oh they're, halluc they're hallucinations nothing to worry about no psychological problem uh they're hallucinations uh nothing to see here move on mm -hmm. and that that did not ring true it still does not ring true for me because these things are there and they will interact with me Mm -hmm. in in a way that doesn't tend to happen on psychedelics it's there is some interaction but not not usually these things are interacting with me telepathically audially and the the the, the experiences will go on I, sometimes very short experiences um sometimes two or three minutes never longer than that mm -hmm. and apart from when it first started happening i've always been okay with it it's it's great <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, tell, I tell people I tell people that and they think you must be off your head what yeah. you've, you, these little creatures are coming in you've got no control over what they're going to do mm -hmm. um I, I do stress when I talk about interaction I've never touched this and never been any tactile yeah contact it's all it's all sound and vision mm -hmm. um and I'm I'm afraid I enjoy it and they're not hallucinations the, yeah. this, uh, that, that is just such a um, a closed inadequate, off view inadequate inadequate view uh, yeah. ex ex exactly it's closed off inadequate view of uh, an entity contact which needs more explanation than just brushing it on so oh it's just hallucination you know you lost lost part of your sight this is what happens with charles bonnet syndrome mm -hmm. no nah, 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 not well i mean it. other conditions where you lose your sight you don't have that kind of uh, oh. neurological reaction um, mm -hmm. You know, if you lose your sight through through diabetes or through age, these people don't have these interactions at all. I know that when I I was quite in a grief process, I had to medicate for the epilepsy. Um, yep. I'm not tonic-clonic, so I don't drop down. It, it is it is uh, very much on a neurological level. I was quite I I was quite in a state of grief because I had the, the world around me was uh, incredible. That's the only way I could describe it. It was incredible and, and changeable and indescribable. Um, I couldn't describe it outside the experiences. And um, I felt very blessed when I'd got over the, the initial fear of, of what I was going through. And now I'm just like, I hate being medicated, but I, I must admit I, I am because I have, to, I have to drive. So I can't have my driver license unless I'm medicated, but these things, these conditions, I know with the epilepsy and uh, the temporal lobe epilepsy and uh, your condition are very, very close in the fact that um, uh, they, they, they're hard to distinguish other than if there is severe loss of sight. And I, I tend to see these and I've done a lot of research into uh, the temporal lobe uh, side of it. These would have been the things that um, they equate to seers and to, to people who are more open and I often think did I bring this on myself did I just open up that little too much that I can't go back I mean what are your thoughts on that side of it yeah uh, I, I think any kind of physical mental condition that changes you from the everyday normality has the potential to allow you to see 
things outside of this standalone reality mm-hmm. um and what it, like you say lots of people who lose part of their vision never have charles bonnet syndrome but mm-hmm. a lot of surprisingly a large amount of people do and uh I, I just think in the same way as taking a psychedelic or meditating or those lesser altered states of consciousness we're, we're talking about, they are just tweaking. They are just tweaking the, the receiving valve in Aldous Huxley's world. The, mm. word, the brain is the receiving valve for what is going on out there. Mm. And if that part of that brain is changed somehow, that will change the reception of the bigger what's Huxley's word word, word for it? Oh, it's gone out of my head. The 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 greater mind, the greater mind. Forgive me if I got that wrong, but you know Huxley's idea of of basically a universal consciousness. That's what there is. As we are using our brains, we're reducing that to make it manageable in the everyday world. Mm-hmm. But what if if that if that reducing valve that brain gets altered in any way, then it's going to potentially open up to seeing and experiencing part of the greater whole Mm. and and these these interactions that you have Mm. do you think that they're purposeful are they something that reflects things that are going off in your life are they um you know are they bigger contacts are they giving information and receiving information is it just a playful interaction what what kind of things happen um yeah as, as before you know on previous podcasts and i've been asked this and i have a feeling that the person is expecting me to tell them the meaning of life please after do interacting with <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately that that ain't how it works Amiss. um for for me it's mostly been quite simple speech patterns mm-hmm. and most often than not it's them telling me to stay calm Mm. and and it's difficult to that that sounds a bit sort of naff but the feeling that comes from that is so think about the the emotional resonant feeling in a dream in the most mundane of circumstances in a dream but you come out of that dream thinking that was just so emotional that was so Mm -hmm. beautiful and it's kind of like that and that's their main message. They always, there's never any hostility. There's mm-hmm. never been any hostility. A lot of people with Charles Bonnet syndrome have kind of hostile things coming in to, 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 to their consciousness. Not every, a, a large minority of them. But for me, it's always, it's always been very beautiful. And I see it as uh, an ulterior life force whatever you want to explain them as trying to keep me calm and stem my anxiety Mm -hmm. which sometimes is off the scale Mm -hmm. and especially when it's first started happening in 2016 was the first early 2016 was the first time I mean I was in a state Mm -hmm. I was totally out of control and traumatized Mm -hmm. and them coming in even though the first time it was like, Whoo! Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but it soon became, it, it started to happen so regularly. And the feeling was always on calmness, one, one of calmness. And, uh, well, we're going to talk about the book in a minute, but there's a, I've, I've, I stole, uh, a, uh, I stole a line from them mm-hmm. about the second or third time this happened to me. Um, one of them was, basically on on the on the the, the on the arm on, on the arm of the chair telling me to maintain a la calma and i don't know what you're saying what, 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 i don't understand it i, I kind of get the resonance i get the vibes mm-hmm. and, and whatever and of course you do a little bit of um googling and you find out that maintain la calma is spanish for stay calm uh-huh. don't, don't worry about it so I nicked that and put that in the book. Um, it, and it does tie uh, into, into the book. I, I, I just, I, I don't want to go into the book just yet because I, I, I know we're tight for time and everything. But um, yeah, yeah. Are, so that these, are they the same species of beings? Are they the same beings? You know, did, can you describe one of them and what they are? And 
Um, well, well they, they they do correlate to fruit and lees fairies usually mm -hmm. the uh, and they're usually male or they seem to be male um a, you know a foot high mm -hmm. moving in a kind of magical way in a in a non-local way if you know what i mean um as in a dream mm -hmm. they'll be there and then without moving here they'll be there yeah yeah something prehensile about them mm -hmm. not quite human not quite human as uh, as with all of my previous experiences on psychedelics meditation there's they all move in that way that prehensile strange kind of movement and then non-localized and non-temporal as well though you mm -hmm. know the, the, they seem to be able to pop up here here and there wherever where, wherever the experience is happening I, sh I should say this this always happens to me in a low light situation mm -hmm or in darkness with the lights on mm -hmm. never have never happened to me in daylight not not a single time i'm uh, not i'm not quite sure what that means i, think, I mean I think it to, to me that uh, working um as, as a paranormal investigator and, and and out on investigation on a regular basis whether it be events or or um people's homes uh, and checking things out one of the things that fascinated me very early on was how we are seen from the other side, how we are perceived from the other side. Are we perceived physically? And it was a question that I quite regularly ask um, and we get, um, uh, uh, my brain today is really bad. So we get stuff on the recorder, but I, I should know what that is. That's like a big thing. Or I'll get thing, things back um, actually audibly. And it's always the same thing. It's always the same word of light we are seen as light now mm. my theory is that when it's low light obviously you're in a more relaxed state but if these are energetic non-material beings then it's mm. going to be easier for them to give themselves form when it's lower light levels because they can project a light in a material fashion that was just mm -hmm. one of one of the theories that i had about why you know the bet betwixt and between times the time when we when we encounter these energies uh, most often yeah no i like that um and i think there's a lot of truth in that uh although with the caveat that again looking at many of these reports in, in the census they were happening at midday and yes broad, day, broad, broad daylight it's not as though it's uh, an essential requirement for these beings to appear whatever they are and however they're appearing it's not an essential requirement for it mm -hmm. to happen in low light but i think it's probably more prevalent that they do as you say uh, that dawn and dusk are often seen as the time when the in-between times when these kind of things are more more likely to happen so mm -hmm. so yeah uh, it of you going to when you're talking about light as well you know you could take this to an even more esoteric level and say that we are captured within light the speed mm -hmm. of light is as fast supposedly as as as, as we can measure mm -hmm. well okay that's that's okay whatever the speed of light is but something can travel faster can't it mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. you can't just put uh, you just can't put a line on that it's it's like trying to describe infinity well okay it stops there well, what's that what's there then mm -hmm. um and so I've, although i haven't really conjugated much on, on this I, I there's something about entities more advanced than us operating outside of the light spectrum mm -hmm. so they're outside of that electromagnetic spectrum they're operating at a speed faster than light and then for whatever reason you know when our reducing valves alter they come in for, mm. for a, probably for a variety of reasons i don't pretend to know you know why they're doing it that's that's in fact that's <laughs> in fact that's probably the biggest question of all isn't it yeah why why is it happening but we would need uh, about another five hours to discuss yeah. that and we yeah. still wouldn't come to any conclusion no i mean one of the things uh, one of the reasons why i set up this youtube channel was because of part of the paranormal side of what i do i remote view properties uh, before I enter yeah. properties which is going in in my mind and searching around to see what energies are in the property it's a safe way for me to do it 
And I was increasingly not coming across spooks, ghosts, spirits of the dead. I was coming across what was in the Fey realm. And um, it, it's been a massive question of mine of, you know, why are they drawn to these properties? Why do they contribute to the to the haunting scenarios? You know, because yep. when, when we get the mischievous part of the realm or the darker part of the realm, they seem to contribute in the chaos of these already sort of um, mm. ill houses, you know, these these um, these houses that harbour um, the, these darker energies anyway. But like you say, we could be decades trying to discuss the reasons why they are attracted or is it that they were there first and they've attracted other things and it's the same on the light spectrum you know are, are the the light beams there first and then they uh, bring in that good energy or is the good energy there first and they use it to manifest it's just yeah and in in some ways th this all relates back to the folklore where the fairies are often they're often tricky yeah um they'll give you fake answers uh or they just won't give you what you need uh and there's no reason for them doing what they're doing really mm -hmm. and i think there's an element of that and if we i mean think about it if if we're talking about um an alien not not as an ex extraterrestrial but an alien consciousness totally removed from human consciousness or or partly connected to human consciousness but they themselves operate in a totally different way how would we understand them how would we develop a language to describe that interaction and why they were appearing why we we're why we were what why we are having those experiences um it, it's it's kind of mind blowing to to try and think about that, and uh, and again going back to to the DMT experiences, my own and the reports, the overwhelming um, thing that you get back from people with those anecdotal experiences is that it, it was something I can't understand. Mm -hmm rarely do any of the beings the entities that are encountered in the dmt experience rarely do they impart much wisdom mm. often it's complete gobbledygook mm. or or they're dismissive of the humans and you won't get actually get that much from it but at the same time the person who comes back and then tries to describe the experience as we were just as we were talking about earlier it's ineffable you can't mm. articulate what these things are like because they are so radically different in terms of their their consciousness their way of acting um their way of interacting you can't describe them and i think that's that whether you're talking about psychedelic experience meditation illness it, it is all the same thing i'm definitely coming to not a firm conclusion but i'm on the way to a conclusion mm -hmm. that they are um in a standalone reality yeah definitely and they are not they are not just within human consciousness even though that's obviously how they interact with us they are in um, a, a standalone reality wherever that may be mm. I, I i totally agree i, I, I totally agree and it, it is fascinating to know how and why uh, that line's crossed and and, and mm. what's going off but i i realize about time i do want to talk about your book and i've got it right mm. next to me and i'm just going to yeah. do do a bit of a bit of a plug and a bit of a ramble before you tell us all about it oh, because, okay, okay. um so this is neil's book and is it on amazon is it um mm. the, the yeah, it's available on yeah, Amazon. All, all, all good bookstores and some not very good bookstores. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, this is Dead but, um, but Dreaming. And I, I was gifted a copy by Neil. And this was uh, last year. And I can honestly say my concentration through the, uh, the whole um, lockdown shenanigans has gone completely out the window. And where I was a, a complete bookworm beforehand, I found it very, very hard to concentrate on, on much during that time. And this particular book was the only, only novel that I picked up in that time that I read uh, front to back and didn't want to finish it and kept having to put it down because I didn't want to go any further in it because it meant that I was getting near the end, which is a big thing for me to say that. 
I absolutely loved it. I don't know what I was expecting, but one of the things for me that came out of this was uh, Neil's your your um, your understanding of the fey realm. I've read books, novels about fairies before, and I'm always frustrated with them just being beautiful or based in uh, some loose folklore or taking just it, it, lifting it out of folklore. This to me from the onset felt like a very personal read. And you were saying that you took little bits out of your interactions uh, with the Fey realm that you'd had, but even the relationships uh, in this book, um, they felt very much like um, these were real people. And uh, yeah, it felt very intimate, felt very intimate. I'm gonna let you talk about it from your perspective. And, um, and I want to say before we get to the end, because I'll get to the end and forget, I've said to you before, we need a prequel to this. We need a prequel. <laughs> I, I want to know how all these people, all these characters have got to where they have. Um, yeah. In fact, there's like, there's at least four prequels that we could do from, from different <laughs> perspectives. I'm going to get you working, Neil. So tell us about the book. Well, well, you, well you've just been telling me how lockdown is, uh, is messed messed with your head mm -hmm. um and unfortunately lockdown has definitely messed with my head and at the moment i'm not writing anything whatsoever yeah um uh uh and so it's not going to happen just yet but I, I i appreciate what you're saying i really appreciate your words it's, 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 uh, it has seeing good reviews um online it's it's very heartening it's because mm. it's, when you write a novel it's you put it out there and you think, oh my goodness, what if everyone hates it? Mm. You know, what was that going to do to my self-esteem? Am I going to be able to deal with it? Mm. Um, fortunately, it's had very positive reviews. I think there are only two reviewers who didn't like it. Um, mm. they not really like. They just had some problems with some of the 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 the, the, the issues that I cover in the in, in the book. But it was um, well. This isn't a prequel, but I, I this, this was my second novel. Mm -hmm. So the, the first novel. Oh, I didn't know that. Is that another one I've got to buy? Oh, no, no, I'll, I'll gift you that. I shouldn't say oh. that. Other, everyone, everyone's <laughs> going to be. Well, the th this, this was, so that was published in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got, called Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun. You might uh, know the Pink Floyd reference there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, it's about the, the, the fairies are kind of there, but um, it's, very, it's very much about drug use. Yeah, and and it's quite vicious. I re I had cause to read it back about six seven months ago, and I read through it. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, did I write that? Yeah, it's, just, it's quite in your face, and a lot of people will be like, no, can't finish it, not can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. So when it came to when it came to writing Dead but Dreaming, mm -hmm. I thought right, I need to change the mindset here a little bit, and I wanted it to be a story about the fairies but they had to be in the background a little yes. bit it wasn't going to be a fantasy novel under any circumstances I didn't want that i wanted to use my knowledge of folklore and about modern fairy experiences and what exactly what we've been talking about for the last hour what they might be what they might not be i wanted to incorporate that but it had to be i had other themes mm -hmm. that i wanted to 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 look at so you know without any spoiler alerts it's about a young folklorist who goes to stay in part of a psychiatric hospital in 1970 mm -hmm. and the part of the hospital they stay in is looking at something called dissociative identity disorder which at the time in 1970 was called hysterical neurosis dissociative type, which I like better actually. Mm -hmm. Hysterical neurosis, uh, more descriptive, isn't it? Um, uh, and that's those were the patients they were treating. And I did that because I wanted to look at the concept of um, many minds in one. Mm -hmm. is, is that possible? It's a really interesting, I find it a very interesting disorder, quite disturbing disorder. Um, and of course, there's loads of controversy about it. Does it exist? Mm -hmm. Are people are people just making it up? Have they got some other mental illnesses? It's actually schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. I say I, I I come down on the side. This exists. This is real. Mm 
-hmm. that people have multiple consciousnesses in them yeah. for whatever reason. Unfortunately, it's usually down to childhood abuse mm -hmm. where that where they've dissociated to deal with that. So, <clears throat> so, so, so I'm looking at the, that many minds in one issue and I'm able to bring the fairies into the story because we're thinking about outside minds, yeah. ulterior consciousnesses and how they interact, not only with the people with the disorder, but the people who are treating them. And of course, the folklorist, this, this is all in uh, the first person. So the folklorist is, is, is me, is I. Yeah. Uh, so how all of that affects affects them mm -hmm. within uh, you know they're down there st supposedly studying folklore and so you get that that mesh of a mental disorder very interesting one um, which in 1970 was very little known about it was mm -hmm. only during the 80s that it became much more well known so I was able to so take out all of that stuff from the 80s when it became really controversial and just look at the sort of genesis of the the, the treatment of it um, and it, it, and well we'll we'll, let, we'll end me talking about it on this because I, I could talk about it for, for ages and it's mm -hmm. gonna make me seem very sort of uh, you know I'd rather be a bit more self-effacing <laughs> so, yeah, it's a fantastic book <laughs> um, but uh, but we, within that multi minds and ulterior entities kind of atmosphere that I tried to conjure up I wanted to talk about solipsism Mm -hmm. and that's a fundamentally important part of of the book so without you know you could go into massive detail about the philosophical concept of solipsism but it's basically um how uh, i have a consciousness horizon this horizon is it yeah no one comes in and no one gets out and it's a it's become a bit of a philosophical taboo Wittgenstein was the first person to really talk about it in any kind of detail in the early uh 20th century um but there's a very influential book which is why i wanted to get to put solipsism to this story this is that will cost you a packet that's uh by jj <laughs> valberg he's a philosopher retired philosopher called dream death and the self and he has a massive section on solipsism and it had a massive effect on me it's a mind-blowing subject because i'm presuming you're sat there yeah. talking to me from wherever you live mm -hmm. but I can't know that all yeah. I can see is the screen in front of me look out the window there are people o o over there in that house are they are they really there they're just subjects within my consciousness horizon mm -hmm. and although at some in some respects it's a ridiculous concept you know I know you're there I know they're there but I can't ever really know be sure yeah and and what what Valberg does in that book, and what the reason I'm talk, using the book about dreams, mm -hmm. often bringing dreams into the reality, and where do they cross over? Um, the best way to uh, analogize solipsism is through a dream, the analogy mm -hmm. of a dream. If you're in a dream, you think the people in your dream exist. Yeah. You think they're people the action in the dream you think that's happening the environments in the dream and then you transcend from that dream and you realize that you made it all up and you did it so successfully in that simulation that you believed everything that was happening in that dream was mm. the base reality but it wasn't and you only realize that when you transcend from it so that's the analogy of solipsism sorry we, we, we've gone off piste a little no, bit no 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 I, 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 <laughs> that word for me was a, a real sticking point a because i'd never come across it before b because i'm dyslexic and i kept reading it in a million different one ways uh because of the arrangement i, I find any kind of words around psychology very very tricky on my dyslexic level um, and I kept having to go back to the internet and, and reminding myself what it meant and every time i reminded myself what it meant it was almost like this is irony this is irony because I don't I don't know it until I've come across it again. It was it, I yeah. found that really ironic. The book for me, um, it was almost like an unfolding and refolding of uh, self revelations, and uh, and it took it, it was I, I love the fact that it did go into darker psychological levels and and um, darker emotive pulls within people. So people in it were. Um, multi-dimensional and we got to see lots of uh, 
lots of interplay with very strong different characters and just when you thought you kind of got to know a character and thought oh I've sussed them something had shift just a little bit and you're like oh there's a there's another kind of element you know and that happens all the way through but the main character that for me would because it was written from the perspective of I was the main character when I was reading it I really emotionally felt for um all the kind of reopening of wounds that go on and the kind of trying to to come to grips and come to terms with things and it was it's almost like it was a uh, a stage set up for a healing process that, that that meant that there had to be pain born out of it to 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 be able to start a healing process and I'm not going to give too much away but um, yeah, don't, I, I, I was, I'm, I'm waiting for you to give a spoiler there but <laughs> no 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 I'm certainly not I'm certainly not no because I I, I think um like I say for me that 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 element and the fact that you said that the fairies were in the background and they were on the peripheral mm. where fairies are to humanity it made it the the incredible book that I wanted it to be. I didn't want it to be, um, you know, just regular encounters and 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 whatnot. And the fact that it's very based intelligently within psychology, um, and uh, you know, you, you sent me clips to audios as well, which were which kind of fit in and and that whole kind of very seventies vibe going off. And well, 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 that that was the other thing. I you know, I did. I, I'm a great progressive rock fan mm -hmm. late 60s early 70s early 70s especially and i i had to get it in to, yeah it's a little bit self-indulgent to be to be honest but if you're trying to create an atmosphere for that definitely for that time period what better way to do it than just keep injecting pieces of music not just willy-nilly you know all those pieces of music were specially chosen to try yes. and you know tease out what exactly what's happening um so yeah no, that was slightly self-indulgent in, in fact one of the bad reviews <laughs> did not like that element what why did, what does he keep talking about van de graaff generator and pink floyd it's self-indulgent it's not though it was it was absolutely <laughs> well in keeping and well fitting with the characters and and the and the particular time in the book when these things came out it wasn't it wasn't just like plonked in there out of the blue I, I like this band I'm going to put them there it was reflect yeah. reflective of a of a of a state within the book it was uh, I thought it was brilliant and and it added to the whole um, sensory experience for me as well because it is again it's a very sensory book it's I, I saw everything and I was able to create the world without uh, without being overloaded with a narrative from yourself writing it I was able to like go yeah I'm in that pub I know this pub you know this is this is yep. uh, very familiar so I'm, I'm going to plug it again so please people you know um you know i'm into my my fairies and i i'm not into my fairy fairies and uh, this was definitely a reader recommend because it's not fairy fairy um, fairy 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 sort of bubbles and you know i, I really fairy. really appreciate really appreciate that I'm, I'm delighted that you 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 enjoyed it and i really appreciate your kind I, I i genuinely did i genuinely did i mean i would be kind if i didn't um but i i genuinely i was i was more than excited and I, when i picked it off the shelf today I was like, I'm in the cover. It, it's so tactile. Um, I'm, I'm gushing about it now, but I, I'm thinking I'm going to have to read this again because there's so much I've forgotten, so much popping up that um, I'm definitely going to have to have to go through it again. I think we're about out of time. I think we've actually run over time. Neil, I do want to get you back at some some stage. I, I would love to have an in-depth chat about um, how we can move forward in, in really kind of looking at ways of figuring out what fairies are and figuring out all the kind of things that we've spoken about, you know, when we've said this needs like five years to be able to, to sort this one out um, and, yep. and, and to chat about as because we're both in the Fairy Investigation Society um, and 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 that's one of the things you know is the, the collection of data is one thing, but I think you know moving forward with that you know it's uh, how do we get evidence based stuff that's not just anecdotal that's not just um, I, I'm seeing light things flying around me I've had this before when I've been chatting with people anyway oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> they obviously like that idea you know little old yeah. guy by um, yeah that's a thumbs up that's a yes do it let's do it. Um, I've often talked about using, you know, the, the technology that we use in the, the paranormal world as something that is maybe a starting point to, to move into um, getting some evidence based 
uh, work together of, of finding, finding the answers really and whether that's just totally off track or whether something else is needed. So as ever, if anybody's got any views on that, if anybody's got any comments or any questions for Neil, um, you know, drop it down below. Anybody's experiences that they've had with, with fairies, um, I'd, I'd love to hear from them. You know, it, I am going to get Neil back. I, I am going to persuade him. I am going to persuade you. Well, well I'd, I'd, I'd absolutely love to come back, because today you think, oh, well, you talk for an hour, you'll, you'll cover loads of stuff. We've really just skimmed I know. the surface of some of these things. And we could take any, you know, half a dozen topics that we've talked about today we could take any one of them and talk about it for one or two hours and go into a little bit more yeah. of a deep a deep dive yeah yeah i mean definitely i mean the things with the the, uh, the archaeology background as well i'm so so intrigued about the uh, you know the connections um, and your experiences within that that re relate back to. But yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop talking because we could be here for another hour. Um, I want to thank you so much for, for coming on and, and, and joining me in my first big interview in a while. So, and it's been super easy, uh, as I knew it would be. Um, loads have come out of it and I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful, Neil. So thank you so, so much. Oh, I loved it. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Kate. You're more than welcome.